Welcome to the Berean Bible class of Elkview Baptist Church. Thank you for joining in in the study today. We're looking at Matthew chapter 12 today, specifically Matthew 12 verses 14 through 21. But just a, a little observation about what's already happened in the book of Matthew chapter 12. It began with Jesus and his disciples going through some grain fields, his disciples Pick some wheat to eat. And of course, the Pharisees criticized them and said they were violating the Sabbath. And of course, what they were violating were the traditions and rules of the Pharisees, not what God's law required. And then just a verse or two later, he enters a synagogue and they're watching him and wondering, well, will he heal on the Sabbath? He does. He heals a withered man's hand or a man's withered hand, and they're upset, of course, because he did something good on the Sabbath, that he healed on the Sabbath, that he performed a miracle on the Sabbath. Think of that. So that's a little bit of the backdrop with what we have, what happened the first part of Matthew chapter 12. So now let's look at what's happening in the last part of Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse number 14. And the first slide here shows uh, the attitude of the Pharisees. Let's read verse number 14 together. And it says, Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. So after these two encounters in the first part of 12, then we have the Pharisees plotting against Jesus. So I'd like to make eight different observations and major observations about this particular verse, verse number 14. The first one is the Pharisees went out. That really is filled with meaning because <clears throat> the Pharisees were full of rage, according to Luke 6.11. And you say, well, why were they full of rage against Jesus? And I've got a list here on this particular slide. Well, one, they didn't like being called hypocrites by Jesus, even though they were hypocrites. And one thing that really frustrated the Pharisees, Jesus was going around doing all these amazing miracles, convincing miracles, evidence of miracles all over the place. And it was so frustrating for the Pharisees because they couldn't refute the miracles. If they could have, boy, they would have. But you see, Jesus was healing so many people that they couldn't do it. Remember the verses we've read in some of the previous lessons where Jesus would be walking through cities and villages and towns and the scriptures would say, and he healed them all of their sicknesses and their diseases, their infirmities, and those that were demon-possessed. He healed so many people that the Pharisees were frustrated. In fact, they wanted to kill Lazarus because Jesus raised him from the dead. So they wanted to kill, kill the evidence that uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead. So it's, it's um, quite shocking how they approach this and their, their, their rage towards Jesus. And then Jesus was gaining more favor with the people than they were. So they were upset about that as well. And of course, the multitudes were following Jesus. He was like a roving hospital the way he was healing people as a sign of who he is. So he gained more honor than the Pharisees, and they didn't like that. And of course, when he preached about repenting, it trampled on their pride, especially when he called them out for their sin. And then in John 8, 11, it also makes reference to the fact that they seem to be worried about their position in the state of Israel. And you would think they would say, look, here's Jesus, he must be the Messiah, let's join him. But instead, they did the opposite. They were filled with rage against him, and they went out after him. So that's number one. Let's go ahead and look at number two about the points about this one verse, number 14. It says the Pharisees went out. And I've got this number two phrased as the Pharisees' pretense. And by pretense, what I'm saying is they were saying they were really upset about the Sabbath violations. But the reality is it went much, much further than 
the things about the Sabbath. They liked nothing about Jesus. Now, I do have to make a little bit of an exception clause here because we know that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were different. They didn't follow the, the mainline Pharisees' narrative about Jesus. In fact, you know that when Jesus was crucified, they helped bury Jesus and anoint his body. So let's move on to my point number three about verse 14. The Pharisees plot, and that verse says, and they plotted against him, meaning they took counsel against him. How could they do it? They work with the group called the Herodians, according to Mark 3. They considered the best ways to go after him and destroy him. And they didn't really want to put him in prison. They wanted him destroyed, according to Matthew 12, 14. They didn't want to just banish him. They wanted death for Jesus, according to John eleven fifty three. So their plot was really sinister against our Lord Jesus. They plotted against him. And then let's look at the observation number four regarding their plot against him. And I've got this one titled, The Pharisees' Dilemma. You see, the Pharisees were really concerned about how the people would react if they took Jesus, arrested him, and killed him. They were concerned because so many of the multitudes and the people thought he was a great prophet. He was working amazing miracles. And Luke 22.2 sort of puts that in perspective. It says, And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Meaning they were trying to figure out a way to do it to preserve their place, yet take Jesus out and kill him. So their dilemma, they feared the people, and the reaction of the people, and what that would mean for them. So let's move on to my observation number five on this phrase, and they plotted against him. And I've got this one phrased, the Pharisees' cruelty. And I think about this and how they were really seeking to destroy Jesus. And I've got that question, are the Pharisees religious people? Can you think of religious people plotting like this? devising false witnesses, ignoring the amazing miracles that Jesus was performing. And there were lots of healings going on. So they have to ignore all that. And then what they really wanted was the question, well, can we just skip the trial and go right and just go ahead and kill him? And that's from John 7, 50 to 52. So the Pharisees had just such a cruel attitude in their plot against Jesus. Nothing fair at all, but cruel. So let's move on to point number six on this verse 14. And they plotted against him. I've got this one titled, Their Deceit. They lied about Jesus. They had false witnesses about him. And then there were bribes. And if you look here on the screen, I've got uh, Matthew 28, 12. It says, when they had assembled the, with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. This is the ones guarding the tomb. And then 28.15 says, so they took the money, meaning the soldiers, and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. So from the beginning to the end, they were watching Jesus, testing Jesus, falsely accusing Jesus, and then you can see here in the end, even offering bribes to cover up the truth of what really happened. So that was point number six. Let's go ahead and move on to number seven about how they might destroy him. I've got this one titled, The War Against Jesus. And this shows you just a few examples about from the beginning and through Jesus' ministry, there were satanic forces working to try to, to destroy Jesus. And item number one on this slide talks about Herod trying to destroy Jesus as a child. That's a pretty common story from really the, the birth of Jesus and the couple years thereafter. Then, of course, the, the temptation by Satan himself. And then there were lots of accusations and criticisms for what Jesus was doing. They were calling him 
a blasphemer for forgiving sin. Uh, they criticized him for eating with tax collectors and sinners. They accused him of casting out demons by the ruler of the demons, and then later down in 1224, casting out demons by Beelzebub. So again, the war against Jesus was ongoing from really the time right after his birth. So that's point number seven. Point number eight is similar, just from a few different books of the gospel, the war against Jesus. It says the Jews sought to kill Jesus for healing a paralytic on the Sabbath. So let's just pause right there and think about that. Here we have Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, healing, doing a good work on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are saying, you can't do good works on the Sabbath. God, you can't do miracles and perform amazing works like this on the Sabbath. Do it on the other six days of the week, but oh, the Sabbath, you can't do good works on the Sabbath. Do you see the hypocrisy in what they're, they're saying there? Because they themselves would do many things on the Sabbath. So the war against Jesus was significant. Um, they tested him, they accused him, and of course, he made them stumble so many times. From the early part of his ministry, even from after his birth, through the crucifixion, they were plotting and accusing Jesus. So with that said, uh, let's move on and look at how Jesus responds to the hatred that the Pharisees had for him, and he responds with meekness. So let's read verses 15 and 16. It says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known. So you think about that. He healed them all again. Such an amazing miracle that he, that he performed in the front of everybody. Such convincing evidence. So let's move on and ask the question about what's going on here. What could Jesus have done to his hateful enemies? Being the creator of the universe, being the one who created all life, being the one who holds the keys of life and death, and being the one whom the wind and sea have to obey. What could he have done with a word? He could have killed them all. He could have started over. But he didn't do that. Even though he had the power to do it. As it says in other scriptures, he could have called on legions of angels to come to his defense. But he did not do that. Why did he not do that? Well, let's move on and answer that question. Jesus could have said, well, look what I've done. Look at my miracles. But instead, he emptied himself and made himself of no reputation. Let's read Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 7 together. These are powerful words. It says, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what we have here is, when you think about this with the conflict with the Pharisees, there will be a day that all of those Pharisees who accused, ridiculed, mocked, lied about Jesus, one day they will all say, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, a hard end for them, a regretful end for them. So, moving on to the next slide, you say, well, again, why did Jesus do that? Why did he empty himself? And let me remind you from Matthew 5, 5, 
Jesus encourages us to be meek. He says, blessed or spiritually prosperous are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says that he is meek. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then in Matthew 21, 5, Jesus describes himself as meek. He says, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly or meek, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus comes in meekness. So, well, let's think about what does that mean? What does that word meek mean? And the next slide gives us a little bit of a clue. The way meekness is used in Scripture is meekness is not weakness. Our society gets us a little bit mixed up with the word meekness and what it really means. But in Scripture, meekness does not mean weakness. So what does it mean? Let me show you the next slide, and you'll see what I think that it means. Meekness in Scripture means power under control, meaning the God of the universe who could have wiped out all of his enemies with a simple word was the example for us of meekness, power under control. So what an amazing example Jesus gives us about meekness. Blessed are the meek. And then let, let's look now at Jesus' response to this situation. How does he respond? Well, he responds by fulfilling prophecy. Let's read a few verses there in Matthew 12, 17 through 21, beginning with 17. It says, he did these things, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. So those are some significant verses. Let's do a little bit deeper dive on some of these. And if you look at verse 18 there with me, where he's talking about his servant and, and being chosen, I've got a verse that corresponds to that, meaning that Jesus was chosen to do God's will. Hebrews 10, 7 says, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So he calls him beloved, and he says you'll put his spirit upon him. So Jesus comes fulfilling prophecy. Let's move on and look at the next verse, verse number 19, where it says, He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Meaning Jesus came crying for repentance or crying out for repentance. He wasn't coming calling for rebellion. And Matthew 4.17 gives us a little snippet of what Jesus was saying. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus cried out for repentance, not rebellion. And that's what that verse number 19 is speaking to in terms, of, in terms of his fulfilling a prophecy. Let's move on to verse number 20. It says, a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flax he will not quench. And you think about those verses, and it seems to me that it's referring to Jesus expressing compassion for either the Pharisees themselves or the weak or the sinful. But then that next little phrase there about justice and victory, I would say judgment is coming. So uh, uh, really a heartbreaking thought or those on the opposition side, those who hated Jesus, who approached him with such indignation and rage. Uh, Jesus was restraining himself, and he knows that there's a day of judgment coming for them. So let's look at verse number 21, and it says there, and in his name Gentiles will trust. 
And of course, we know from Matthew 10, 18 and Luke 2, 32 that there are examples where, yes, Jesus was called to the, to the house of Israel, but both the New Testament and the Old Testament make it clear also that he was coming as a testimony for the Gentiles as well. And I think those two verses on that slide make that point, and you can read those. So we, we think about all these verses and all these things that we've just read and covered, and as we wrap up the lesson for today, what, what should we do because of these truths? And I would say, one, we should follow Christ's example of meekness because there's many things that come across our mind in this culture where you see people in opposition to the way you believe. We want to approach them with a meek and humble spirit to win them over because we know that, like Jesus mentions and is recorded here in these, these verses, judgment is coming. So we need to pray for those people and as Christ encourages us to love our enemies and pray for them that, that persecute us. So if you would, please join me with, in prayer, and we'll close out the lesson. Father, we do thank you for the words you put before us. You give us such an amazing example of being meek and humble. Help us learn from your example, and help us be people that please you. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen.